In this lesson, we will be covering the dysesthesias as a broad group of neuropathic pain disorders. Burning mouth syndrome is a member of this group, and even though this lecture is dedicated to BMS, touching on some of the other dysesthesias will not only help reinforce points raised in lesson 1, but will also help in the better understanding of subsequent lessons. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to mention and describe these various types of dysesthesias. The word dysesthesia, which has Greek origins, simply means abnormal sensations. These sensations are unpleasant and, like in BMS, oftentimes they occur in the absence of clinical evidence of pathology. The symptoms can occur at any site of the body, but are more often in the mouth, the scalp, the skin, the legs, and the genitals. Patients suffering from any of these dysesthesias may complain of burning, tingling, stinging, pricking, pruritus, hyperpathia, hyperalgesia. Notice the symptoms are exactly the same as we saw for burning mouth syndrome. These sensations are often spontaneous in occurrence and are always unpleasant. Now, the presence of a psychiatric illness, this is very important, the presence of a psychiatric illness may intensify the symptoms of all these anesthesias. For the purpose of this lecture, let's reclassify the dysesthesias into two main groups, the oral dysesthesias and the extraoral dysesthesias. Now, here is the table listing all the various types of dysesthesias. For the oral dysesthesias, BMS is the prototype, and both terms have often been considered as synonyms in the scientific literature. We will look briefly at all these various types in a second, but for now, just have a glimpse of the table. Detailed lectures on these will be made available basically moving forward. Now, there is a term that we have to get out of the way before continuing the lesson on BMS, and that is oral synestopathy. Oral synestopathy, or kinestopathy, is an intractable feeling and perception of unusual orofacial sensations without factors to explain their occurrence. Well, you may notice this definition sounds very typical for BMS and the dysesthesias in general. That may be true, but unusual orofacial sensations in this case comprise symptoms such as the feeling of excessive salivation or saluria with excessive sliminess, a jaw vibratory sensation, the feeling that there is pressure on the jaw or that a tooth is being extracted, and sometimes the sensation of having a furry body within the orofacial complex. As a result, synesthopathic patients will frequently seek dental treatment in the hopes of alleviating these sensations and removing these so-called foreign bodies. Now, obviously, these attempts often prove futile and useless, and in fact, in some cases, oral synesthopathy has been triggered and worsened by dental treatment, for instance, extractions. As of now, it is classified as a persistent delusional disorder in the 10th revision of the International Classification of Diseases and is therefore considered a mental and behavioral disorder. As such, treatment involves using various psychotropic medications and sometimes electroconvulsive therapy. A more detailed lecture on oral synesthopathy will be found in the lecture catalog on this website. For now, let's go on and look at brief summaries of the different forms of dysesthesias. Our very first dysesthesia to consider will be the scalp dysesthesia, which is also known as Bernard's scalp syndrome or trichodynia. Now, if you have taken lesson one, I'm sure you'll see familiar trends in the nomenclature and definitions of these conditions going forward. Scalp dysesthesia is burning tingling or itching of the scalp without physical evidence of scalp injury. The symptoms are often spontaneous and may be intensified by psychiatric or emotional stress. Now, other more common causes of scalp burning, such as shampoos and other hair products, have to be ruled out first. Hair loss is frequently a feature of scalp dysesthesia and may occur concomitantly with or be a sequela. This figure should demonstrate how this may occur. So basically, as a result of all the itching sensations going on, the scratch reflex becomes activated. 
the scratching obviously will not alleviate this itching and this creates a scratch each cycle. This repetitive scratching leads to scalp excoriation which in turn damages the hair follicles in the local vicinity with resultant hair loss or alopecia. And this alopecia can be permanent. Scalp disease cystia is commoner in women and treatment follows closely that of BMS as we'll see in section 4 of this lecture. Next on the list will be occlusal dysesthesia, which is characterized by the feeling of an altered and uncomfortable bite sensation in the absence of obvious occlusal discrepancy or damage to the oral and maxillofacial structures. Such patients often make mysterious occlusal complaints and are often always checking their bites and trying to reposition their jaws in order to locate their correct occlusal relation. For this reason, occlusal dysesthesia has also been called phantom bite syndrome, occlusal hyperawareness, occlusal discomfort syndrome, and occlusal dystopia. These patients feel their bite is wrong and believe that this wrong bite is a cause of the problems in their life. And as a result, they seek numerous dental treatments, moving from specialist to specialist, trying to find a solution to their symptoms. Clinicians who fall for them eventually find themselves frustrated because the downside is that these treatments do not work, and hence categorizing these patients as being refractory to treatment, and every treatment intervention worsens their symptoms. The Fifth Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5, by the American Psychiatric Association has termed occlusal dysesthesia as a somatic symptom disorder. Therefore, when such patients are identified in the dental clinic, a psychiatric referral is often appropriate. Let's move on now to the neural dysesthesias, comprising dysesthesia of the lingual nerve territory, inferior alveolar nerve territory, and the mental nerve territory. The pathophysiology of these may not be as mysterious as the other dysesthesias, and they almost always occur following some traumatic events in the orofacial region. Such events include third molar extraction, when the inferior alveolar nerve is closely related to the third molar, root canal procedures, especially in mental nerve neuropathies, implant placements, and inadvertent nerve injury during local anesthetic administration. The symptoms felt in these conditions are not different from the other dysesthesias, except that they occur within distinct anatomical boundaries. For a unilateral lingual nerve dysesthesia, symptoms are localized to one half of the tongue, floor of mouth, and lingual gingiva up to the midline. In inferior alveolar nerve dysesthesia, the lower lip and chin are the affected areas together with a general discomfort in the jaw on the same side. Mental nerve dysesthesia or neuropathy, which may also be an oral manifestation of sickle cell disease or be a reflection of paraneoplastic syndrome, is localized to the ipsilateral lower lip and chin. A full review of orofacial anatomy will be found in the anatomy section in the lecture catalog of this website. For all of these neural dysesthesias, resolution can have a prolonged course, and it all depends on the initial severity of the injury or whether any further injury occurs down the line. Next up is cold dysesthesia in which an individual has increased sensitivity to basically anything cold, so for instance, cold drinks, cold food, or even cold weather. It occurs in people on certain anti plastic agents, and is often accompanied by tongue burning, tingling, glossodynia, and general jaw discomfort, especially when chewing food. One very important chemotherapeutic agent known to cause this is oxaliplatin, and symptoms may start soon after or during the infusion of this drug. Ozaliplating is often used in treating metastatic colon cancer. When cold neuropathy extends to the pharyngeal area, it is termed pharyngolaryngeal dysesthesia and may sometimes affect deglutition in these patients. The management of cold dysesthesia involved keeping a warm environment, including avoiding cold foods and drinks. It often resolves after cessation of the drug. Vulvar dysesthesia or vulvodynia is a member of the genital dysesthesias and is characterized by burning, pyritis, stinging, and irritation of the vulva and vaginal entrance without clinically evident lesions. And like in the IHS definition for BMS, vulvodynia will usually be present for more than three months and may also be a finding in patients with restless genital syndrome. 
Prolonged sitting or having intercourse typically makes the symptoms of vulvodynia worse. Other members of the genital dysesthesia include clitorodynia or clitoral dysesthesia, vestibulodynia when the vulva vestibule is involved, penile dysesthesia, Brennan scrotum syndrome, or penoscrotodynia when both penile and scrotal tissues are involved. Treatments of these dysesthesias are not too different from BMS. Peripheral post ischemic dysesthesia or PPID. Now, sometimes when we sit with cross legs for a long time or sleep on an arm or wear some tight shoes, we begin to feel this tingling or numbness downstream the compressed body parts. And sometimes when we touch these areas, pain can result. Well, this is due to ischemic injury with subsequent reperfusion injury to the nerve and the generation of reactive oxygen species in the nerve vicinity. PPID is often reversible. Last but not the least on the list is metabolic dysesthesia or metabolic neuropathy, which is a frequent finding in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, but may also be seen in hypoglycemic states. As part of management of the metabolic dysesthesia, controlling the primary metabolic disorder is paramount. To learn more about the oral manifestation of diabetes mellitus, please check the systemic oral lesion section in the lecture catalog. If you would like further details on any of the relevant dysesthesias to dentistry, specifically occlusal and the neural dysesthesias, please check out the lecture catalog. This brings us to the end of lesson 2. Take a coffee break and continue with lesson 3. Do not forget to mark this lesson as complete.